Well, thank you very much, uh, Hillel, for this uh, invitation. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Subhas, uh, Director of Universal Rights Group, which is uh, uh, a think tank in Geneva, uh, basically focused on the work of the Council, but the uh, UN human rights architecture itself. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have recently produced a report about uh, an assessment of the uh, output of the Human Rights Council, which was created uh, in uh, 2005 following uh, a decision of head of states uh, uh, during the World Outcome, Docu World Outcome Summit. And eventually, um, uh, the function and the mandate was elaborated uh, in a resolution uh, 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 in 2006, Resolution 6251. So what does the council do and how basically it addresses what we are discussing uh, today? So uh, when the head of states eventually gave the mandate uh, uh, f uh, to uh, set up the council. The main function was basically, if you look at um, the World Outcome document, was to address cross and systematic uh, violations of human rights. So in this respect, uh, the council has several mechanisms. The first mechanism, of course, is its resolution system, which is its main output. What is a resolution? A resolution is basically uh, the will of an, the international community to address an issue of uh, human rights violation or an issue of human rights uh, in general. Then you have uh, its different mechanism, the special procedures, which are independent experts uh, with, uh, set up to examine country situation, but also to examine um, uh, issues of uh, general thematic uh, nature. You have also another mechanism called the Universal Periodic Review, which is basically the peer review of, uh, uh, of uh, member states of the UN in terms of their human rights situation. And uh, uh, then the fourth is also the complaint procedure, which basically is the communications, which if you, for example, uh, have suffered a human rights violation, uh, through a communication, you can also address um, uh, your grievance to the, international, to the UN, so that the international community at large um, uh, is aware of this issue, and also like then the members of the council will have to address, uh, to address it. So our report basically uh, made an assessment. Uh, now we are reaching the 10 years uh, of, the, uh, of the council's creation. It was created in 2005. Uh, so whether the assessment was with whether the council is really responding to what it was meant uh, to be created, uh, to, to do when it was created. So in that assessment, basically, uh, one of the positives, some of the positive aspects we saw was basically the council has been very good in producing resolutions. So last year, basically, they produced 112 resolutions. And uh, if you compare that to the cre when it was created, there was only 43, so it's a 160% increase. So this means uh, governments and member states have been very active in uh, uh, addressing various human rights issues. The second aspect was with the special procedures mechanism. Basically, now you have 109 member states which have given a standing invitation to special procedures. Uh, and standing Although not all, not all of them, sorry to interrupt you, there are some countries that give a standing invitation to special procedures, but I understand when the special procedures ask if they can visit, these are investigators on country situations, yeah. like on Iran, or I don't know if they have a standing invitation no, or not, but there are countries that do, yeah. and they don't respect it, right? Uh, yeah, so this is one of the weakness. I was going to come uh, to that. You have then the UPO mechanism. The UPO mechanism also, in terms of participation, all UN member states basically has participated in the mechanism. But I say it's a peer review, so uh, I'll come later to that. Um, to that, what is a, the positive side is basically you had 116 uh, 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 member states of the UN, which was represented at ministerial level. So what does this indicate? Also, it indicates like at one time when human rights was just being discussed in a closed door. Now, more and more countries, uh, and uh, in particular many liberal democracies, are putting like, human rights at the very forefront of their political decision system. Uh, so these are the few points for, for the success. So when we go deep in the study, to look, okay, we have 112 resolutions. So what does this resolution do? And as a council, you have 10 like, um, issues are discussed under 10 agenda items. And uh, what we saw, like the majority of these resolutions are under item three, which is basically general thematic issues. While um, uh, like 7% of the council output is about addressing gross and systematic violation. 
So this is what the question is, whether like um, uh, this was a mandate and a vision which head of states uh, gave the council. So this is one of the questions which, which, which we asked uh, in the report. And now looking also like um, on thematic resolutions, it's like um, the impression we got is operating in a vacuum. You have very good thematic resolution. I think we have discussed here ex freedom of expression, human rights defenders, freedom of association. But what we saw, there was no sort of cross vitalization with the other mechanisms. And I think, Hilal, you, you yourself has experienced it when basically you went to the council and basically we were talking about freedom of expression of a particular country and you got a point of order and you were interrupted. But this is where we want to make the point, like you can't talk about these issues, which are basic human rights, in a vacuum. Basically, it has to be addressing specific violations, specific... And, uh, and just to in, in, interrupt here, you, if I remember correctly in your report, you say that there are countries that are very happy to talk about things in the abstract. Exactly. But the moment that you want to actually point to a country and say there's a victim here, you're not respecting freedom of speech, you're not respecting freedom of religion, yeah. you're not respecting the rule against arbitrary detention, they don't want to talk about it, they'll interrupt speakers, whether it's me or, or victims that yeah. we bring. Exactly. And I think you had a proposal that, that the abstract resolutions on themes should reference specific cases Violation, and yeah. turn a spotlight, yes? Yeah. So this is what we call a hybrid resolution. Basically, like freedom of association should not be uh, the first two observations we made, for example, even in renewal, renewal of mandate of the special rapporteur, uh, no mention is made about the country visit he did. But this is one, basically, where you see there's no like a sort of cross-fertilization between the special rapporteur and the resolution system, setting it up. But the second also is basically nothing prevent um, the council to discuss about this specific violation on freedom of expression or freedom of uh, association within, within uh, a specific region or a specific country. So this is where like, we made that proposal that, uh, uh, and this also like, then redress uh, uh, the disbalance which we have in, in the activities of the council. If I take, for example, like we did an, an analysis on the session, so like 27 days the council talks about general thematics, and then only uh, basically six days on country specific. So it's like the most session, for example, you have only six days. But this is not the main purpose uh, of the council. This is what we want to basically. Well, I, I, I agree. Once again, you're, you're, you're saying according to your study, there's an enormous focus on thematic, more abstract things. Yeah. But in terms of specific people, the victims that we heard today, yeah. putting a spotlight on them, much less attention and some members are happy about it. Let me, we don't have much time and we have to go to our, want to hear our other speakers before we wrap up today. But I, I do want to ask you on one issue and I don't know if it was in your report, but there's the issue of membership. Kofi Annan, when he talked about reform in 2005, he said we have a membership that is selective, that is politicized. Um, uh, sorry, he said the work is selectivity, politicization, casting a shadow. He said the members are joining not to uh, promote and protect human rights, but to shield their own records of abuse. And we heard today from victims of China. We have with, with us here a great activist, but he's also a victim of Chinese human rights abuse. We heard from victims of Cuba, Pakistan, Russia, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, who won our Courage Award. All of these countries are elected members of the Human Rights Council. The European Union, half of the European Union voted for China and Russia. How do we know that? It's anonymous. But China and Russia won 176 out of 193 votes last year when they elected Human Rights Council members. It means only 17 countries in the world did not vote for Vladimir Putin on the Human Rights Council. If you assume that of those 17, it was the US, Canada, and Australia who didn't vote, you're left with maybe 14 EU countries that didn't vote but 14 did vote for Vladimir Putin and the Chinese Communist Party for the Human Rights Council. Um, very quickly on the membership, what are victims of these countries, China, Cuba, Russia, Pakistan, Venezuela, supposed to think when across the street, those regimes that oppress them sit as elected members, some of them with virtually almost the entire United Nations membership, including the EU, voting for them? Well, uh, again, you know, like this is an issue about the election, and the election was decided uh, in one of the resolutions. It was basically uh, longly debated, but eventually the rules are like any country can join the council. But the improvement with the council has done also is basically countries under sanctions. Well, just, uh, I just want to say, there is criteria. Yeah. The resolution 60 slash 251 says candidates are supposed to have a record on promoting and protecting human rights. That was debated and put in the resolution. So aren't we entitled to ask the membership if they're respecting their own criteria? Uh, 
Yeah, of course, and then you have the issue of voluntary pledge also, which countries are supposed to do, but uh, no one has, this is one of the weakness, how to... They make pledges. Yeah? Venezuela made wonderful pledges. Yeah. So this is where basically, um, uh, no, this is a question which uh, is valid and also it needs to be asked when countries are electing membership. Like one of the dog chapter, well, one of the bad things we saw last, last uh, year was a liberal democracy, for example, like Costa Rica, was not elected as a member of the council. So this, this is all the challenges which the council uh, will, 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 is facing. And as you basically also like, uh, the council will be only best performing at this mandate when its membership also is uh, on that mandate. Having said that, also we should not forget um, it's a UN. So the UN, you have all uh, all, uh, uh, well, you have 193 countries which basically have different uh, uh, human rights records and how, but uh, the whole idea is uh, when the UN itself was created is basically to create that dialogue between, uh, between all countries. So this was a, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to wrap up on that and just comment is that you're right, the United Nations was created for dialogue, but not only, we're marking 70 years of the victory of World War II. There were two sides in World War II. There was Hitler and the anti-Hitler coalition, who during the war called themselves the United Nations. Then they founded the organization 70 years ago um, in October 1945, and it was the anti-Hitler coalition that stood for something. And the, the United Nations Charter is a great liberal international document. It speaks on values and freedoms. And you had to qualify to be a member. And today it's considered obvious if you're a country uh, that if, God forbid, Daesh should become a sovereign state, that, you know, the Islamic State, that they will be a member of the UN. Well, it, it sh countries shouldn't necessarily be. But on, on the Human Rights Council, you know, we said that countries are supposed to meet criteria. And then we have the criteria on paper. Cuba, China, Russia, Pakistan get elected. They go to their people and they say, look, we're on the Human Rights Council. And so I'm wondering, maybe we just scrap the criteria. And I think it's something that your group does wonderful work, and I encourage everyone to read the studies on, at Universal Rights Group on their website. It's a great stuff. And I think some, something we need to think about, that in 2006, we adopted criteria, and the members, the criteria are ignored, because that's the nature of the politics. Criteria are ignored, but then these countries have the badge of honor, which is false. Maybe scrap the criteria and make it every UN country gets to be there, just like in New York. They're all on the third committee on human rights. I think it's something to think about. I want to thank you for, for your comments. And again, I urge people to read at length the report that you talked about at, at Universal Rights Group. Um, I want to move to our, our next speaker. You've heard from Ladan Barumand, who uh, chaired one of our panels. She's a uh, public intellectual. Uh, who uh, is an author, 2009 recipient of the L'Equilenza Prize, which she shared with Roya Borumand. Uh, Ladan, we don't have very much time, but in a few minutes, you were sitting here today, you were listening to the very intense uh, presentations. Uh, should we be pessimistic, depressed, optimistic? What is the future of human rights? What's the future of liberal democracy? Um. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Hillel. Um, uh, the prize we won, well, it's the prize was for the uh, human rights work we do on Iran. And actually, let me start um, by the bad news on Iran, since Masi Ali Nejad gave the good news, where you see this Iranian civil society and specifically women uh, fighting their way towards uh, freedom in, in uh, a very creative uh, mode and, and way. But, um, um, and this will add to all the testimonies we, we have heard recent, uh, today and, and yesterday. Um, I, we have documented just for February 72 executions in Iran, more than 160 executions uh, since the beginning of 2015. And there are people on death row for apostasy. They cut limbs for petty theft, whereas you have these huge embezzlements of uh, public funds by, by the establishment. But I'm telling this... Well, and let me just interrupt. The, the, we had an election a couple years ago for Rouhani, and the headlines in Europe was, he's a moderate. So uh, just briefly on what you talked about, executions, did it improve under Rouhani? Well, yes, they have. The, the, the executions rate has increased, but steadily uh, since 2005 in Iran. So, but Rouhani doesn't... So it's have, gotten worse. Yeah. The There's more last, executions, last not less. Years, last year, we had more, more than 800 executions. Under the moderate. Yeah, but the moderate is not in charge. 
the supreme leader, the judiciary is independent from the moderate. And I wouldn't, um, I would believe that Rouhani's group would like to lower the rate, but they have no power on that. Um, they are there to negotiate the nuclear issue, not uh, improve any other uh, issues. But the, the fact is that um, the, with the wide range of people you had here uh, testifying, we could also see through them and through their testimony the challenges that liberal democracies, and let me just narrow it down. Uh, in French, we would, see, we would say l'état de droit, but uh, the rule of law. Uh, states that are based on human rights declaration. So that would clarify where all the individual rights are respected, protected, and are the basis of the institutions in the society um, are, are being challenged. And these challenges seem to be some old, but some new. We, we, we have seen um, the, Countries like Venezuela and Turkey um, seeing the reversing trend from democracy towards authoritarian regimes. We have heard about torture in Venezuela, about lack of freedom of uh, expression and the press in Turkey. Um, R Russia, of course, is getting more and more authoritarian and aggressive. Um, uh, China is not really changing the Tibet. All these countries, North Korea also, all these countries show that we, we, there is from the state a, a trend towards uh, authoritarianism and a challenge to human rights in the states. But also we have seen from Boko Haram to, uh, to ISIS, there are new form of challenges that are uh, non-state challenges to human rights that we are facing. And these uh, challenges also comes all the way to the heart of Europe, which we heard with Charlie Hebdo and the problems um, raised by Charlie Hebdo's massacre is that we realize that um, the, the basis of social contract sometimes is not even clear in the mind of people in the democratic societies by the, by the fear, by thinking and hesitating about the right to blasphemy and freedom of expression and the limits of free, freedom of expression. We, we see that there are a lot of challenges that we are facing and we can't find the result and the solutions in, in the books because we are in, the new, in a new world. Nation states are fading away, new polities, international, uh, supranational institutions are emerging, Individual, um, um, individuals are be becoming actors uh, without the uh, state. And all these issues that we are facing, we, we, we don't have any analysis or we don't have categories that allows us to understand and to fight back. I think one of the, the major issues that we need and our problems, in, especially in democratic worlds, is that we need to have the courage of thinking. We need to have the courage of thinking again. We need to, and also in the Muslim world, we have talked about the caricatures, about insulting Islam, but which one of us in the Muslim world had the courage or even intelligence of saying, who is caricaturing uh, Muhammad the Prophet? Is that Ben Laden who is caricaturing or, or Sharb? Honestly, who is taking, uh, using the Leninist tactics, the Stalinist tactics, the Nazi tactics, and put it in, under the name of the prophet? Who is really caricaturing the, uh, the, the prophet? We need to take, to fight back by new concepts and by uh, attacking those who are attacking us. And I think this is uh, very important. Another point that I noticed, although it was a Really, you, you could think everyone came here to complain about the violation of the rights. And it's violated by a petty criminal who has the capacity today to go to a newspaper and massacring 15 people or go to a school and uh, kill Jewish kids because only because they are Jewish and until someone powerful like Putin. But the, the fact is that the very... Um, the fact that we are here is also a ray of hope. 
the Tibetans are not destroyed. They have created a virtual state, democratic state. They organized uh, elections. They have a state. Their foreign minister was here. Uh, so basically, there, we are able, civil society is able to create new form of legitimacy and to oppose them to the legit dictatorial legitimacy. And I think this is where we have um, some hope and we need to work on. So we need to have the, the courage of thinking independently and we need to continue our action in favor of civil society and human rights that are really non-negotiable. Thank you so much. You've given us uh, a lot to think about and, and uh, we're good to end with a note that, um, uh, of, of some hope. Uh, on, on that uh, same note, uh, we have with us uh, Yang Jianli. I've introduced him before, but I'll say again, he's the founder and president of Initiatives for China. He is a former political prisoner who risked uh, everything to speak out for freedom and democracy in China. He's also a member of the advisory board of UN Watch, and he's a great friend and supporter of the Geneva Summit and helped us get the wonderful young people from the Hong Kong umbrella protest movement. Uh, Jen Li, we're here today. We are activists. We are uh, diplomats, journalists. We're trying to put a focus on human rights. Our, our, our tools are words. We don't have battalions. We have words. You know, the Stalin famously asked about the Pope, and, and how many uh, divisions does the Pope have? Um, to say that, you know, who, who cares what a moral force will say? It all matters if you have tanks. We have words. You were sitting in prison in China. Um, as a foreign political prisoner, do the work that we do, and I mean everyone here, the words that we say at the United Nations, at civil society forums like this, do they matter? Do they make any difference at all? Um, that's a very good question. Let me uh, begin with my story. I try to keep it very short. I, I was arrested while helping the labor movement with nonviolent struggle strategies, returning from the United States in 2002. Um, I was kept in solitary confinement for nearly 15 months. So during this time, I had no information outside whatsoever, no book to read, and no um, body to talk to except, to, uh, except uh, in my interrogators. So you, you can imagine, I almost collapsed. You know, I just couldn't help but thinking of the worst things that had already happened to me. What are the worst things? Number one, friends have already forgotten you. Who cares you know, where you are and, and things like that. Number two, the family has already abandoned you. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, regrets, uh, anxiety, and, uh, you, you know, uh, you just collapse in that situation until a day, until a day when my attorney finally was uh, allowed to see me in prison. Uh, I could remember the first visit in prison, uh, and he told me, during the past uh, uh, 15, uh, 15 months, there has been outpouring international support behind me. Uh, US Congress passed uh, resolutions on me. President uh, Bush raised my case a few times. And the State of Department uh, raised my case to his or her Chinese uh, counterpart. They're involved the two state, two uh, secretaries. Um, uh, uh, they're uh, Chinese counterpart, my case, and Amnesty International issued um, uh, uh, three urgent actions on my behalf. And uh, when I transferred from one prison to another, I received a bag of, of um, uh, 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 cards from all over the world. There were about more, more than 200. So ever since that moment, I stood up. I stood up even in my cell. And I began to engage right-defending activities while in prison. So I saw the hope. You know, in my case it, you know, is true for, for almost other cases. I think every case. You can imagine around the world, there's so many legions 
imprisoned so many human rights activists, probably their only hope, their only hope is the international support. It's the voice. So we, our work here is, irrele is irrelevant, is concretely connected to their struggle in their country, even in the uh, prison cell. And, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes, w the, you know, the, the release, the freedom of a, a particular prisoner may not take place um, in the time frame that we wanted, but it worked. It worked with my case, it worked with many other cases. And oftentimes, it's too often, we hear the world leaders citing economic, cultural, his, histor historical justifications for their turning other, uh, looking other ways when it comes to the issue of human rights violations. And you know, their, their uh, excuses are too often and too easily rationalized. Once rationalized, the non-confrontational, -conf non-committal policies actually can only whet dictators' appetites to abuse their own people. And the, 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 the victims becoming non-people in the eyes of the abusers. So the international pressure uh, in this case, you, you, you know, really help. If you cannot have the prisoner after prison right away, at least you can help improve the prison situation. So ever since the first visit of my attorney, my prison situation gradually, later, rapidly improved. So I have a lot of information, I have a lot of books to read. And now I'm a free man. I can speak for others, for my uh, uh, fellow uh, prisoners, because I'm free. So if all, everybody is in prison, we cannot accomplish anything. So if you want to help a country to democratize, you have to help these prisoners release, be released from prison. We cannot do very little if everybody is imprisoned. And we really need world leaders, who, world leaders who are there to show solidarity with and to assist the people living in dictatorships. We need world leaders who have uh, such a vision and courage to make it clear they cannot have a normal relations with the state that abuses its citizen, only citizens. So uh, I want to pay my homage to the human, human rights heroes uh, whom we have uh, heard from in the past two days. Their voice must be heard by heads of states, policy makers, foreign ministers, indeed everyone in the world. Their voice, the actual those of a people, rather than the government, must be heard by the uh, decision-making mechanisms in the United Nations. Chen Li, uh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you just heard us the final message of the Geneva Summit from one of the world's most famous former political prisoners, Words Matter, Action Matters, uh, words and action for human rights uh, lifted his spine when he was in prison. It's a message for us that uh, it's a call to action and it's a, um, uh, a source of energy for our own work. Uh, we'll conclude on that note. I want to thank everyone uh, for being here today. I'm going to invite uh, all of our speakers, all of our partner NGOs, all of our volunteers to come up on the stage. We're going to move the chairs and we're going to take a, a group photo. Thank you, everybody. While we're gathering, I, uh, I just want to thank our interpreters who uh, do terrific work every year, and we're so honored uh, to have all of you. So thank you for the wonderful work that you do. And uh, of course, thank again all the volunteers uh, who've given of their time and of their effort to be with us.
Let's bring this one as well. We want all that. Yeah. Yeah. My best friend is amazing.